Uh, yeah, because I, 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 I see the book, there were too many words, and I just uh, reason what I know. <laughs> okay, that works. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, I just cut short all the details in the, in the book and all these examples. And just, just do it slowly. Yeah, so uh, what the book does is that they try to introduce, like, five different trees so I just list them out them as a summary and then they start by the the decision trees and they say that in decision trees they have all these predictors and then we they cut them into like some non-overlapping regions like they're like treating the predictors like like a big piece of cake and then they use the knife and cut them to different pieces so, and that's why they say it's like non-overlapping and then for each region like this region they just take the mean <laughs> they just take the mean as the as so that if any of the new data falls into that region that mean value is taken as the new predicted value <laughs> So how they create these boxes, this non-overlapping region is that they still do the same thing as the linear model whereby they use all the observed value and they subtract the predicted value and see how far, how far the error is. And this time they do it in each of these boxes. Yeah, and this is the predicted value, which is true, the, the mean of the training observation in, in that box. Uh, but they claim that finding all possible boxes is not feasible because it's too slow. So what they do is somehow like a bit of a greedy approach, whereby they still have all the predictors. And this time they try to be a bit like greedy about it and they try to cut it one by one, but each cut is such a way whereby you have the least uh, error for your training data set. So let's say like these two are your two new uh, regions as a result of your cut, and then they calculate this uh, uh, square sum of error by the true value and the predicted value, and they try to make it as small as possible. And then they keep continuing this cutting process until each square has a meets a minimum number of training samples. So, so this is like an example like I took from this slide and these two is like the RSS like this this one and this is like the different ways that they cut. So this line is the cutter and then they move the cutter and they calculate the RSS accordingly. So the cutter is like moving from left to right. And then from there, they try to like minimize this RSS. And you can see like the number starts to go down, it starts to go up again. So like for this case, like the cut is, the good cut is the, the one that, that makes this RS square is like around here. So this is just a good example. And they do this for all the other cuts, continue this cut until you have like no regions have more than five observations or some other trash to stop the cutting. And uh, there's also an animation from this website, which I which is also displayed in the RSS uh, book down, but I decided not to show that. I just put there as a link you can watch by yourself because it's too long. And if we run this video, I will not be able to finish my, my talk. <laughs> so you can watch this in your own free time. So they said, however, the book mentioned that the problem with this is that it actually overfits the data. So they have another strategy that is, to me, when I saw the formula, it is kind of similar to like lasso, but instead of treating the predictors as the number of like the B0s, here they just put as the number of terminal nodes or the number of like endpoints that the tree has. So they start by growing a very big tree 
growing a very big tree. And then they tune this alpha, like the lasso method, and then they increase the values of the alphas, which is kind of like similar to like cutting the terminal roads. Because the advantage of the lasso method, which we discussed a few weeks ago, is that you can make the predictors to be not used. So in the same case, like as we increase the alpha for this case, some of the nodes, the terminal nodes, will be also not used. So as a result of using like different values of alpha to tell you have a different subtrees because like one value of lasso, uh, one value of the alpha will cut maybe two of the nodes, and me another value of the alpha will cut like three of the terminal nodes. And then we have many, many different subtrees. And then they use like cross validation to, to pick the alpha that gives to pick the alpha that gives you the best subtree or the subtree that minimize this uh some uh the residual sum of squares. So uh they also introduced this pruning formula, but it kind of to me like it looks like the lasso's one because this is kind of like similar to the, the RSS. And this is the additional part. And why they have this additional part is because they want to penalize trees that have a lot of terminal nodes or in simplified form, it's like, I think it's just penalize complicated trees and try to favor less complicated trees. Uh, yeah, this is just my message. So it's actually much more simpler. So they also have uh the set quest also has a animation on this, but I also decide not to present some time. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the second part they talk about is the tree. So the difference between the, what we have is that for the regression tree, right, how they predict the value is that they take the, the mean of the regions, all the training sets within that region, and they just take the mean. However, for classification, right, you can't do that because we can't measure the error rate because when you take the mean, we can just take the errors between the true values and the mean and get the error rate. But for binary, for classification tree, right, it's only have like nominal or classes, uh, there has to be a new way to measure this error instead of this residual sum of squares. So at first they introduced this error, which is like more of like the intuitive method, is that they take the proportion of training observation in that particular region that belongs to that class. And then uh, they take, because each of the boxes you have points that comes from different classes. So they take the largest class and then they the sensitivity uh, what he try to say is that as the e does not change much as your tree starts to grow and so the vision here is the e is does not change the value much. So they try to find more sensitive classification error measurements and they introduce like this Gini index or the entropy. So for the Gini index, they kind of look similar whereby uh, the small values indicate that large number of observations come from a single class. So it's kind of so the Gini index, it looks kind of similar to the original definition, but where they still use like the proportion, but this time they put it in this way so that they, the values will vary between zero and one instead of 
yeah, it's still valid between 0 and 1, which is kind of like same as the E here. And they say that when you have all the observation belongs to one class, you have the value of 0 because this value will be 1, I think, and then there'll be 1 minus 1 that gives you 0. And then if you have like all randomly distributed, you only have a value of 1, but I'm not very sure how they got this value, actually. And 0 0.5, on the other hand, it just says that some the distribution of the different classes in them is equally distributed. And then they mentioned that the entropy is just, they use the log function and they since this value is less than one and to make it between zero and one, again, they add this negative value here. So the key thing is that if the proportion is small, that means your region is kind of working your region is kind of working because your region is truly cutting the cake in such a way whereby each slice is truly belong to just one class and it's like very like homogeneous. So I, they, I tried to find out like what's the difference between these two measurements and what they are truly useful. So I found this link here and they, they try to separate these two and they try to show like what they are kind of useful in different cases. But usually most of the time, uh, I think most of us just use trial and error and, <laughs> and find out which index works best for your own data set. But I think this would provide some guidelines that hopefully will be useful. And then the book goes out and says, like, is it really better to use a tree model versus a linear model? And in the end, they say that it depends because, like, they say that if you have the data where that has, like, regions that can be separated by a line, then they said that the linear model will work better no, ma no matter how complicated your tree is because your tree can only cut horizontal and vertical cannot cut sideways. So, so because of the limitation of the trees that you can cut horizontal and vertical, uh, if you have a data set that's separated like this, uh, it may not be so optimal. On the other hand, when <laughs> there are some data sets that by, it kind of favors when you cut it horizontally or vertically, and that is the case whereby the tree works better than the linear model. Yeah, as you can see, the linear model it can only be a line that can rotate around. And no matter how hard you rotate the line, and you cannot, and probably linear model is that you can have another line to separate it. So it's also the, this is like the best that you can do for this data set. And then the next section of the book is that they also compare that linear models, uh, sorry, uh, like decision trees are usually more interpretable. They say it's easier to explain because, because it's kind of similar to cutting a piece of cake with different colors. And they think that it's more intuitive of how humans separate two groups. Uh, however, they say that it's less robust, meaning that if you have a small change in your data set, the tree actually could drastically change as well. And the tree may look different from its previous form. It says that it might hurt the performance in its prediction. And that is why they have other trees besides this decision trees and that's why they introduced this bagging random forest and boosting to improve the prediction but sometimes they have to sacrifice the cost of this interpretability
And then it goes to the first part to make it more robust, which is to do bagging. And how it tries to stabilize the prediction is that they mix the data sets. So, so in hopes that a mixed data set will give you different trees that are more robust to changes of the data. So in this case, they have, they call this V and they have like different bootstraps data sets to create V different regression trees. And they give this symbol whereby this V is from one to B and these are your trees. So if you have a new observation, a new to predict, I think it's lagging. Is, no. it, is it lagging for the rest of you? Uh, oh, sorry, I heard that we are, we are lagging. So where have we need to continue from? Uh, I think I didn't get you from the this lagging, these slides onwards, yeah. Okay, okay. So this has covered, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so I just start again is that we want to stabilize the predictions as a result of the change of data for the trees. So the first strategy they create was to create bootstraps training data sets. So basically they try to change the data set so that it keeps giving you different trees and they use the different trees to give a final prediction. So this is how it works is that they have B different training data sets because it's bootstrap. So they give you B different trees called this, whereby the B comes from one to B. And let's say you have a new prediction, new observation to predict, we call it X. So they're gonna use all the trees to create B predictions. And then from the B predictions, they just take the average. So that's why you have the average of all the B predictions. And this will be the, the final value will be the predicted value of the new observation. <coughs> In the case of classification, uh, they just record which class each tree takes. So B, the first tree may say class A, the second tree may say class B, the third tree may say class A again and up to the B tree. And then they will just take the majority votes of the B trees. So now they have a predicted value and observation. They need to have a way to measure error without using the test data because our B somehow is a bit arbitrary. We have to find a way to optimize this B such that it gives you the best model. So it's like, like tuning that, like it's like the previous example where we have this decision tree and the cost pruning formula where we have to tune the alpha. So this time we have to tune, find a way to tune the B, but we need a form of measurement that is using our existing training data set. So what they do is that because it's a bootstrap data set, so uh, they try to use a limited amount of the training data. They say that it's usually two thirds. Lah. And then because it's two thirds, the other one third will not be used for, the, for that particular bag tree. And they call it the out of bag observation. So maybe tree one has these two thirds and then tree two, there'll be some that don't use and some that we use. And for tree, so those that is not used will be the out of back observation. So because uh, every tree will use two thirds, so every tree will have its own sets of out of back observations. So hopefully uh, all the out of back observations will cover the whole training data set. Uh, <laughs> This I cannot guarantee. 
So, uh, ass- assuming that everything is nice and good, uh, given an out of back observation for that particular back tree, so how they predict the error for, for that tree? It's again. Prediction will be similar to the previous slide, is that they'll take the average of the trees that do not use this out of the training data. So they take the average and majority votes if it's a classification case for these specific trees. So because you have a prediction, you also got to have a true response because they all came from the training data set. So there must be a true response. So each of its prediction will have its true response. And from there, you can calculate the error, which is usually the same as the RSS, whereby they take the difference and they square them. Or uh, you can use, for classification errors, you can also use the Gini index. So because you have now have a, out of box RSS, we can for each of the back trees. So we can cover different cases, right? So for different B values, like if you use only one back tree, you have one RSS score. We have two back trees, you have another RSS score, and we have and we use the the B value that gives you the less the least value of this. So this, this B can be determined, that like, can be so called be, like optimized by using these uh, parameters to optimize. So the next part of the book says that usually it improves the prediction, this begging method, but usually at the expense of interpretability because now you have more than one trees and it is possible that different trees can say different things now so it's no longer clear which predictor is more important so what they say is that they have this chart that says that provides some form of summary of how important each variable are and how they determine this value is that they just record how much this average RSS, which is this one, improve or de- decrease, improves or decrease, uh, improves, oh, sorry, improves as you split the tree to give of a given predictor. Then the next part they say is that there's unfortunately some disadvantages with the bagging method because uh, because we only change the bootstrap data and it is a very high chance that even though you may mix your data around, your trees may be still be highly similar to one another and that kinds of Make, they say make it less robust in the end or more as robust as it should perform. So they give a case whereby if you have like a very strong predictor in your data set, then by this greedy principle that we used earlier on for the decision tree, then most of the VEX tree will just keep using this strong predictor in the top split regardless of changes in your training sets that, is, that, that was led by bootstrapping. So because of the top part being the same, it is kind of like making the trees like look very similar to each other because if the top part is the same, the bottom part may be different, may not have a very good impact on how it predicts anymore. So uh, they decided to make some improvement and they saw the improvement is to simply just change the way the tree splits for every given set of bootstrap samples. So instead of using all the predictors as like split candidates, 
they only use like a group, a sample of them, so that uh, if your cases may have like a strong predictor, if you create a random sample, this strong predictor may not have a chance of being chosen, and then you can end up having a completely different tree. So this is just what I wrote here, is that you are being selected during the split and provide other predictors a chance to make this new tree and hopefully we have trees that look different from each other. So I think that request also has this animation whereby we have these different trees as well. So you can just watch it in your own free time. So this chart just shows from the book is that this is the out of back error for the bagging and the out of back error for random forest. And you can see that the random forest, because the trees are more different from each other than the back method, it gives you less errors for the out of back data set. Similarly, for the test data set for the hard data, you can see that the bagging, like the, the error is like kind of like the same, even though you have a lot of trees, that's because maybe uh, the trees kind of look too similar to each other. However, for the random forest where the trees may be slightly different at the first few initial amounts, so the test, the error kind of decreases, so it kind of shows that it's working. This random selection is kind of working. Then the book goes by another method they call it boosting, whereby it's a completely different method from the previous two. So in the bagging, they say that each tree is built on a different training data set because we bootstrap them. But um, for the boosting case, they actually is a bit different. They still use the whole data set, but this time they use one tree at a time such that one tree first predicts the whole data set. And then if it predicts a value, it has some errors, right? So they call these errors residues. And then from these residues, they create a new tree out of it. And then this new tree will try to, to predict the current residues. And then the, the process continues. So the, I find this method, it's just opinion. It's kind of like similar to the partial least square components, whereby each component is built based on the response residues left by the model created by the, the previous partial least square components. So why they want to do this is because of the wish, the goal to keep each tree different. And how they keep each tree different is that they want to make each tree as small as possible. But why they keep this tree as small as possible, if you terminal note is like, I think number one is that they want to ensure that the current residue is like big enough for the next tree to predict. And also, uh, because the new tree uses a brand new data set, there's a very high chance that it will also be different from the previous trees, from the previous tree. So uh, they said that the book says that they only use for regression. Uh, it's only described in this book. Uh. Uh, so they have, this boosting has three different parameters. So they have the number of trees, how much you can split or how deep your tree is and a shrinkage rate, more like a learn, some people call it the learning rate. This is to ensure that the tree is different from one another. I mean to ensure that the next tree is different from the previous tree. So they start everything from zero and a cost because 
if the predictor just predicts everything is zero, the residue is just the whole data set itself, the whole train data set. So they first pick the first tree and then they, they reduce the, the, the tree so that they can make the residues as big as possible. Let's make, make here. So they reduce the tree so that this will be as sufficiently large for the next tree to make good predictions as well. So this is the part where they reduce the tree after hitting your number of splits, they reduce the tree and then they update the residues based on the trees that it could not predict. So because this tree could not predict, these residues will be reused by the next tree and then the next tree will sh will be again shrunken and then the new residue will be formed. So basically each tree is trying to predict something that the previous tree has failed to predict. And then because we have B number of trees and similar to the bagging method, all these trees will be added up to each will be added up. So when you have a new value X, we just put all the new values in all the different trees and we just add them up together. So uh, this uh, step quest also has a video on this and I think it's uh, quite long also, uh, 16 minutes. So they give you uh, examples of how these new trees are created and you can watch at your own free time. The last, and this is just the different comparison between random forest and the boosting, whereby that refers to how short the tree is. And we can see that for random forest, like this is the test classification error for what for one of their data sets they experiment on. And you can see that for boosting, when the it works well when your each trees are small. Because I think when that equals to one, I think it's just three layers. I think the, tr the tree only has one, two levels of splits. So I just try to see that boosting does sometimes work better than random forest. Now, uh, after this, three methods, they go through this uh, Bayesian additive regression tree. So for simplicity, uh, they only go through again, like, like for, for the boosting, the regression part only. So they, in the, this part of the book, they recall how each method tries to tweak something in the, to make it better. So for bagging, they tweak the training data, whereby they bootstrap the data. For random forest, they tweak the predictors by each tree is only given a random set of predictors to make the tree. And then for boosting, each tree is built based on the residues, which is actually signal that is not yet accounted for by the previous set of trees. And what this book is trying to say is that this uh, Bayesian additive regression tree tries to combine all these three properties together. So how does it do it is that they define some notations by the same thing is, they still have the same number of regression trees as in bagging and boosting and random forest. And the way they create the model is again the same as the bagging, boosting and the random forest that they add them together. Now, this time, the only difference is that they have a, a something called the number of iterations for the BART algorithm to improve the trees. And this is just the prediction formula for the cave tree, which is the same as the bagging and boosting. This is like the predicted value. And they also have an additional one. It's called the burning iteration, which will be used later. So like I mentioned before, like the boosting, the tree model is created when you sum up all the small trees together. And because you have, you do this for B number of times, because the number of iterations in the bar algorithm, you will end up having B of this summation of trees. So you have B number of this summation of trees. So, uh, 
how it works is that the first iteration is that all the K trees will only predict one value, which is the mean of the response divided by the number of trees. So it's the response, you sum them all, all together, take the mean, take the mean, which is the total number of training data, and then you divide by the number of trees. And because of because the final model, I don't say the final model, but the final step for the tree is the summation of all the trees, right? So there are K of them. So there are K of them. So end up, you just have the mean. The, the first iteration is just the mean of the training data. In subsequent iterations, uh, you will have each tree will make a change. So we just give one tree. So for the given tree, uh, you're going to have residues. So it's kind of like similar to the, the bagging method. Uh, sorry, not the bagging, the boosting method, whereby you start with the first tree and then you predict the values and then you have residues and then you go to the next tree. And then you have another set of residues. But this time the residues are calculated a bit differently, whereby the residues are calculated by the predictions and minus things, information that is captured by the other k minus one trees. This is different from the, the boosting method whereby the prediction is done by the previous trees, but this one is done by the other trees before and after that particular tree that you want to change. So this is part of the prediction that is the trees that has been updated by the algorithm. And this part is that they'll be updated at the later stage. So this is how the residue is calculated. However, uh, what do you mean by updating the tree? So this tree will be updated in such a way whereby there are a few possibilities. So possibility is that they can just remain as they are. The simplest case is that tree can remain as it is. Another possibility is that that tree may add a different branch, a new branch like this case. So this like remain as it is. This is the case whereby it adds a new branch. It can also be the case whereby the, the tree can be pruned, whereby it cuts off this branch and became like this. And it can also be the case whereby the prediction values will just change totally, like, like in this case. So this is the possibilities that it can change. And this change, each of them will be given a probability value. And how they get this probability value is by some Bayesian method. Why Bayesian? It's because they calculate it based on the current tree that it has and the partial residues. So it's like given this tree and your residues that was calculated previously, what is the probability that you should add a branch? What is the probability that you should prune? What is the probability that it should so do this and so forth? And how it does is that if chances are that if those changes, if you improve the prediction, they'll be given higher probabilities, in, usually in the case. Uh, however, to make the tree also like, like the boosting method to make the tree small, when you have more complicated trees like this, some, some penalty scores will be given as well. Uh, however, because this, com this formula is a bit complicated, so I, I, the, I don't give, the book does not give so much information of formulas, but just give words to describe what it actually does. And why it gives this uh, penalty scores? Because I like boosting. Our algorithm actually does not control how deep the tree should go because our algorithm only controls this K, B, and L. There's nothing to do with that. There's no depth control. So this, all the depth control is, is controlled by this Bayesian calculation in general. So once you have all these probabilities, the, the algorithm will, I will say, roll a dice to choose which pathway the tree should take. And sometimes a uh, higher probability does not mean uh, 
that path will be taken for sure because it rolls a dice. I think they do this because they want to also ensure that each tree is different from one another. And hence, uh, that selected tree will be then used to fit that residue that was calculated earlier. And then the algorithm will go to the next tree until it finished all the K trees. And once it finished all the K trees, it creates the new model, which is to sum up all the trees together for that particular but iteration. And then this is just for one tree and they repeat it for this number of times. So uh, this is an example that I found in one paper whereby this is just one iteration of the bar whereby they use uh, four trees. So the first iteration is that they just take the mean of the training set and nothing is predicted. The second prediction is that they go through each tree one by one. And for the first tree, there's no change. So it chose to stay as it is. The second tree it goes, there's no change. The third tree it goes, it decided to split. And then it goes to the fourth tree and then it says, okay, there's no change. And then it goes to the next iteration, iteration number two. It goes to the first tree again and says, okay, no change. Second tree, no change. Third tree, it splits again. And fourth tree, no change. And then the iteration goes this time. First tree, no change. Second tree, there's a split. Third tree, there's a split. And the fourth tree has no change. And, the, and this book just tried to show like how the iteration goes on until the fifth iteration. The, in this case, the, for this example here, the B, the B here is equals to five. And the K here is equals to four four for the trees, uh, sorry, four for the trees and five iterations. So now you have like all these trees. So each iteration, right, has its own model, right? The first iteration, model one, model two, model three, model four. So you have a total of B number of trees, B number of this. So they have the B number of trees. So they said that because the first few models will usually give a poor prediction, which is referring to this view, the number L was chosen to get rid of these first few models. So these are no longer, they are kind of removed. And then how they get a prediction from a new data set is that given a new data set, Let's say uh, our L is the first tree, the first tree, the, the first tree uh, groups. So the, the, the so-called new observation, we're only going to use this one, this one, and this one. And prediction value for this one will be the sum of these trees. So one prediction. Prediction number two will be sum of these trees. And sum of these trees of so prediction number three. So you have three of these and they take the average of them. And I think that should be it for the, the basin additive regression tree. So this, this was just from the book that summarizes what I have said is that first it initializes, initializes everything to take the mean of the data divided by the number of trees. And then the first iteration is that it's just the mean of the, the data set because it just sums up all these. So it is the mean of the data set. And then for each iteration, it tries to create uh, new residues based on for each tree. Uh, sorry, for each tree, it tries to create, it calculates new residues based on it all the other, what the other uh, K minus one trees can predict. Now we have our new residues. We try to see whether we should change the tree or not using the Bayesian calculation. And from there, we go to the next tree. After we finish all the trees, we sum them up by creating this, because it's an additive tree. So we have a, the model is the sum of all the trees. 
And because there are B iterations, so there'll be B number of trees. And we choose an L to cut down the first few trees because they're not so good in prediction. And this will be our final model. Okay, and I think I just reached our last slide. So I think that's it that I can. And then uh, I think for next week, uh, there'll be a lab session. I, I, I still just finished it. Uh, let me see if I still have my GitHub page. Uh, Yeah, so uh, I'm still making my lab page for this, but if you want, you can take a look at it. Uh, I might open the chat for this again. Let me see. Okay, here. Then this is my lab page. And I think if you miss my slides, uh, I can just post it in the chat again. Yeah, and then I think you know, the page one. Yeah, and then you can use my slides and you can just watch all these YouTube videos at your own time. Yep, just in yeah. time before we end. <laughs> but there's a very good presentation, right? Do you guys have any questions or anything that you guys are curious about to understand? Hello, I'm sorry again I was late, but it was a really good presentation. I was so um I was amazed. Thank you. Yeah, he included all the animation video in it. So I think that's a very good thing for us just to have a look at the bagging and the boosting method. So it's in time. So the plan, Jeremy, is the plan to do the lab next week? So yeah. Yeah, I think I can. The I think the thing that I stuck with is the visualization. Like I was trying to get some R packages to work. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think part three. But I think for the Bayesian part, uh, I only managed to get the code to work, but there was unfortunately no visualization for it. So it's only gave you like predicted values and that's it. Ah. <laughs> yeah, the visualization is a bit uh because it's still relatively new, I think. And I think uh the tidy models just included it like a few months ago, I think. So uh mm. only can give you the the prediction, but I can't give you the images. Uh, and the original package, like the images is just new, all the trees that you created for each iteration. Oh, okay. But we'll see how it goes. So I think yeah. next week we'll just do the lab. Then following, I will present that chapter nine. I think chapter nine quite a long one. So I might take a while to present the whole chapter nine. Okay. Yeah, I probably would take about three weeks <laughs> if we doing the lab as well. Okay. Okay, so that's all for this week. I'll see you guys again next week. All right. Bye-bye.